is Michelle Browning Coghlan. I am an attorney in Louisville, Kentucky. I focus primarily on trademark law and other types of intellectual property law. I am mom of two teenage girls, both high schoolers. So we're busy, busy, busy. And um, I'm also the founder of a group called Mothers Esquire. And um, Mothers Esquire is an organization that was founded as just a small Facebook group in 2013 to focus on moms who are lawyers. Um, to try to address retention issues in the legal profession for women um, by specifically getting to the issues of um, motherhood penalty and um, looking at how we can help to provide encouragement, community, and support for women lawyers who are moms to address some of the specific and unique challenges um, that mom lawyers often face. Um, I think it's really important that groups like Mothers Esquire are out there and available because we need to create communities of support and encouragement um, for women. We need to be able to collectively address issues that um, that we are facing uh, versus sort of internalizing and thinking that perhaps we're failing. I think that's something that I've experienced of thinking um, just I'm never doing enough and I can't get it all done and feeling like perhaps it's something that's with me or, you know, again, somehow that I'm failing. I wanted to create a community of support to give women a chance to see that they're not alone. They're not the only ones who are struggling with many of these issues and, and probably most importantly, um, to externalize some of that sense of failure and look at it and examine it as um, part of a bigger system of biases that we still have in this country um, towards, well, not just this country, but everywhere towards women um, and a particular bias that is towards mothers. We have such a preconceived notion about what mothers are and what they should be and who they should be and what they should spend their time doing. Um, and um, sometimes we refer to moms as super moms and saints. And while that's really sweet and often we really do appreciate having a pat on the back um, for because we do work really hard, um, putting moms on that kind of pedestal, um, expecting moms to be these all giving, um, you know, constantly focused on their kids, um, sort of, you know, ethereal person is really, I would say it's a pedestal that is in essence a cage um, because it, it, it really puts women in a position that anything they do that is not focused on their children or anything that they do that is not all giving is, um, is outside of what they ought to be doing as a mom. And that's really limiting for women for their careers. Um, so I think it's really important that we have communities of support and communities of discussion to allow women to talk about the issues that they're facing, some of the um, challenges that they're facing and to allow them to see that they're not failing, they are in fact succeeding and doing a really good job, um, and that there are systemic changes and systemic issues that we can tackle together. Something that I wish that um, the world knew about moms, um, about professional women um, who are moms, is I wish they better understood the actual research behind the motherhood penalty there's, uh, I think people kind of intuitively know that moms face a lot of challenges. I think many times what we think about when we think about motherhood penalty is we think about the fact that uh, women do tend to carry a, a more of the responsibility of, of child care um, and, and caregiving responsibilities that that does tend to disproportionately fall onto women's shoulders or mom's shoulders, um, as well as house house related activities sort of the ceo of the household tends to by default be with moms um and and while that's changing and improving there's still a lot of research that shows that that work still does get shipped disproportionately to women um, both within the household and within a community and often even within a workplace and so i wish more people understood that the motherhood penalty is not only about the disproportionate amount of unpaid and often underpaid labor that women face. It's not just about the amount of caregiving that is um, shifted to, to women, both physical, physical caregiving and emotional caregiving and the, the what we call the mental load of remembering when the soccer game is and who's giving a ride to whom and who's having the sleepover and whose birthday party it is and whether the gift has been gotten and whether so-and-so has homework that's due and um, history class. Um, there is a lot of work that goes into those kinds of things. However, beyond just the amount of work that's being done, there's research that shows that there are specific biases towards mothers such that um, a woman who has the exact same skills as a man 
um, but the employer can, by looking at a resume, for example, um, see that she does activities that are, maybe she volunteers at the school or does some other activity that indicates that she is a mother. Um, he can also indicate that he's a father. He will actually get a bump and the likelihood that he'll get interviewed for a job, she will be less likely to get interviewed. If those two same identical resumes are reviewed for the purposes of, um, of giving a, an initial salary or potentially a bonus or promotion, um, fathers will get a bonus, a fatherhood bonus, and mothers will most always get paid less. And it's not just less than a man, it's actually less than a woman who doesn't appear to be presenting as a, um, a parent. Um, so there is a specific a specific bias that attaches to mothers, and unfortunately, that bias creates an impediment to women's achievement, uh, women's ability to advance both um, in title and responsibilities as well as in pay. Um, and it also then ends up inhibiting um, their chances to gather new skills, um, all of the things that go with that that would allow them to move their career forward, get um, get sort of set aside because of our belief systems around what moms should be doing with their time. And um, so I wish, I wish that more people understood just how impactful um, our biases about mothers in the workforce are um, to the ability for women to advance in their career. And given that many, many moms are either the sole uh, earner in a family or like in my case, the, the, the higher earner in a family, I think that it's really important that we start to move away from these assumptions and biases around mothers and what their place is in the workforce. So that's something I wish people understood more. Doubt. I want to talk a little bit about doubt because um, there's some literature out there. There are a lot of things that say that women have you know, struggle with confidence or imposter syndrome or um, that we potentially have um, have more doubt and addressing and in going for the things that we want to do. Um, I think that maybe that is the internalization of systemic biases that women do legitimately face in the workforce. Um, the book Lean In came out several years ago and there was a little bit of hoopla around it and many people really loved the book and I thought there was a lot of great content in the book but one of the criticisms of that book was about the idea that if you just lean in enough that you will succeed. I don't necessarily think that's what the book was trying to say. I think in the end that, um, that, that what they're trying to say is that we must continue to push forward as women and if we're going to reach gender equity, we, we get so many messages from family members, friends, in the society about what we must be doing as mothers or what constitutes a good mom um, to the extent that we start to internalize those messages. We start to believe that if we're not, you know, standing in the kitchen baking cookies at the end of the day when kids get off the bus from school, that somehow we're failing as mothers and internalize this image of what a good mother is. And, and somehow um, that then you know, is reflected in the way that we feel comfortable in pursuing our careers or our interests um, outside of our motherhood role. And I think that that when we think about we that there are so many women that have such great confidence and have such great skill sets and are incredibly um, uh, incredibly capable and skilled and knowledgeable and can just do anything they want to do, but that we impose this notion that a woman's way of being or a woman's way of pursuing something um, is less than, like we associate leadership skills in a more masculine way, we associate caregiving as a more feminine trait, and so anytime a woman steps outside of that, and frankly, anytime a man steps out of that role and tries to be a more caregiving person, we tend to feel like there's some sort of discord there. And um, I think that, you know, it's not so much that women lack confidence or women have doubt in themselves. It's more that there's a system that doubts them. And over time, that does start to create an impact on a woman's ability to continue to push through. You know, if you're, I always say, if you're running into a brick wall over and over again, at some point in time, you start to realize what I'm, I'm not going to break through that brick wall. So we need to really address um, we really need to focus on addressing the obstacles, the hurdles that are in women's ways, so the brick wall that's kind of in front of them, rather than trying to 
tell them how to repel the brick wall. Um, I don't want more climbing skills. I want a hammer to take down the wall. Um, I think it's really important for businesses and industry to, to, um, to really support women in leadership because that is the way that we're going to move forward. We need to see more women, women, all women, women of color, um, uh, women from different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, women uh, of just all women need to be in more leadership positions because we need that diversity of thought, diversity of experience, um, we need that to be in leadership roles, making decisions about policy, about business, about um, the things that we view as important. You know, it's easy to say data is data, um, but which data do we value? Uh, which policies do we value? Which, which um, uh, objectives um, move to the top in terms of what a business might be pursuing? Uh, it's very important to have diversity of thought um, and leadership. And um, I think having more women in leadership and women are more than 50% of the population. So um, ideally the leadership is gonna reflect the population, um, especially a, a population that it's trying to potentially um, certainly provide policy decisions for, but even if it's a consumer product, if it's trying to market a consumer product to the general population, it needs to be thinking about that product in terms of the actual population that's out there. And if there aren't enough women in leadership, then we continue to miss the mark on terms of um, what's important and, um, and, and again, what data, what data should we be valuing, what policy should we be valuing. valuing. So it's really, really important that we have um, a lot of intentionality about getting women into leadership. Um, and, and that may be a little bit uncomfortable and may require changes from what's always been, the processes that have always happened. Um, and so we may have to really step back and, and change the way we do things in terms of how people get promoted into leadership positions. Um, but I think if we can approach approach it with that intentionality, um, that our goal is to get a leadership of an organization or community or political representation that is reflective of the actual population that that will really advance um, a lot of a lot of really critical issues that we face um, both within business and in the community.